name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. We have come once again, brothers and sisters, to these weeks at the beginning of the Lenten Triodion, the period that prepares us to enter upon the struggles of the great and holy fast of Lent. And so last night, we heard for the first time, as we will hear week after week in the weeks ahead, the beautiful hymn after the gospel reading at Matins. Open to me the doors of repentance, O life giver, for my soul goeth early to the temple of thy holiness, coming in the temple of my body, wholly polluted. But because thou art compassionate, purify me by the compassion of thy mercies. This hymn is like a trumpet cry blasting out over the, the hills and the fields, calling us together for the struggles that we are about to embark upon, like the soldiers that are called to rally for a battle, or the gladiators who are called in, into the arena where they are to struggle for a crown. We have been called now. We have been called to shake off our laxity. If we have been lax in our spiritual life over the past year, now is the time to begin to prepare ourselves for the struggles of Lent. The doors to the arena of our salvation are opening, and we are called to enter. And then today we heard the gospel parable of our Lord about the Pharisee and the publican. And this parable teaches us the spirit with which we must embark upon the struggles of this period. For the two men that went into the, into the temple that day, the one had all the external marks of piety and righteousness and virtue. And you'll note that Christ doesn't criticize him because he was wrong about the claims he made about himself. For all of the tithing and prayer and work that he did, his fasting and his struggles, he criticizes him because of his pride, his self-righteousness, and his judgmentalism towards those that were around him. Whereas the publican who came in, knowing himself to be a sinner, bowed his face to the ground, would not even lift his eyes up to see the glories within the temple, but simply uttered the prayer, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so, brothers and sisters, these two men, from each of them, we learn a lesson. From the first, we should model ourselves and strive for the virtue that, that that Pharisee exhibited, at least in the external form, but we should avoid the pitfall that he fell into of self-righteousness and judgmentalism of those around us. And on the other hand, we are to learn from the mistakes of the publican to avoid his life of sin, but to, to, to cultivate within ourselves that spirit of humility and repentance. Because if we do those two things together and enter upon this season, we will make a good struggle. We will have a good Lent. And that so the church is calling us through these various things and will through these remaining weeks as we prepare for the feast to shake off our lethargy, to prepare ourselves. And in her wisdom, she allows us to ease ourselves into the fast. This coming week, we dispense with fasting altogether to remind ourselves that fasting in and of itself is not the end. God is not looking for us simply to keep a certain diet. The fasting is there to help us to attain to Christ. But we cannot do it without the fasting. We need this aspect of our struggle. But the church gives us this week, and then in the remaining weeks, we will slowly work ourselves into the struggles that we will embark upon during the Lenten fast. But we might stop to ask the question at this time, as we, perhaps we do each year as we come to Lent. Why? Why all this asceticism? Isn't it out of step with the modern world? Don't we know better now? Haven't we gotten beyond all of these archaic practices? Well, I want to meditate on these things today. Why it is that asceticism seems so odd to the world around us. Why we, infected by the world around us, may be tempted to think it seems odd as well. And what it is that the church is really calling us to. Archbishop of Virki of blessed memory remarked in a writing of his on fasting and asceticism in the contemporary world. How foreign 
the practice of asceticism, spiritual struggle, seems to many today, even to many who call themselves Christians, even to many who are Orthodox Christians. He says, on the one hand, many in the world, when they hear the word asceticism, it immediately conjures up for them images of gloomy individuals perpetrating monstrous acts of self-torture in a fanatical spirit, akin to people walking across, across hot coals with bare feet or whipping their bare backs by themselves. Certainly, this is far from the truth closer perhaps to the mark, but still missing the point ultimately, there are those who might see asceticism as simply a form of self-restraint of our natural needs, limiting them to the bare minimum, but seeing this almost as if it were an end in and of itself. Archbishop of Virki goes on to tell us that instead we should see asceticism, the Greek word meaning exercise, askisis, we should see it as the constant practice of performing the good works of our salvation, that is the things that manifest our love of God and our love of our neighbor, and those practices that we perform to help break down our sinful opposition to doing such good deeds. Let me read that again. Asceticism is the constant practice of performing the good works of our salvation, and practices we do to break down our sinful opposition to doing such works. And so when we think of asceticism, immediately what comes to mind? Acts of prayer, fasting, perhaps keeping vigil, almsgiving, going to more church services, reading spiritual books. In each of these, our ultimate goal is to foster a life in Christ, a life that is in keeping with his commandments, a life that fulfills ultimately those two great commandments, the love of God and the love of the neighbor, and to recognize in ourselves that there is so much that is in opposition to these. We want to please ourselves, we want to please our passions, our desires, and to get rid of that garbage, to break away those roadblocks, we use things like fasting, like our prayers, like our almsgiving, to break down that opposition to the good works of our salvation. Now certainly, much of what we do in the church does seem out of keeping with the world around us, but I would say that that is a problem with the world and not with our practices. I want to read to you what came before the epistle that we heard from St. Paul today, because he describes very well the times in which we live, and perhaps you will feel a pinprick in your own heart because perhaps some of this may describe our own lives as well. In his epistle to Timothy, he wrote before the reading that we heard today, Know this, my brother, in the last times, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It sounds almost like the, uh, what you'd want to have on your resume if you were trying to make it in much of the entertainment industry these days. If these are these marks of so many people that we see in the prominent positions in our society, we must t gather from this that something has gone terribly wrong. This is, a, this is a resume of the sinner. We might stop to think for a moment, where have we seen images of this? Maybe in the people around us, maybe in our friends, in our family, on the television, in the politicians, or might we look into our own hearts and see some of these same things and ask ourselves how far astray we have gone from God? Well, what lies at the heart of all of this? What produces such vile fruit? You remember Christ has told us a good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. What is the tree? What is at the root of the tree that produces such fruit as what St. Paul has just described? Well, he goes on to say that those men of the last times 
that they will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. And he warns us, St. Paul says, turn away from such people. For these are the sort who creep into the households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sin, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I would say that at the heart of this uh, manifestation of human wickedness, there is that form of godliness, as St. Paul says, that lacks the power thereof. That is an understanding of God that is completely impotent to change humanity. An understanding of God, an image of God, that is completely bereft of the true reality of who God is. And I would say that this is what one sociologist has defined as one of the prominent religions in America. There is no church to be found for this religion. You will not find people who openly espouse themselves adherents of it. But it is the, more, the religious thought known as moralistic, therapeutic deism. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. This term was coined by the sociologists Christian Smith and Melinda Denton. They had performed numerous surveys with young people, teenagers in high school, asking them very open-ended questions about their religious beliefs. And our young people are often very good indicators of what is afloat in the society around us. They're kind of the canaries in the cavern, so to speak. They're the ones being most infected by the media, by the entertainment industry, and by the popular ideas that are out there. And so after serving thousands of teenagers, this was the five-point creed that they were able to put together of the general religious views of the teenagers at that time. And by, that by this time, they've already grown up and they're in their late 20s. So hear what they had to say. Number one, the moralistic therapeutic deus believes God created an ordered world and watches over human life. Okay, that's, that's almost good. We'll, we'll see how pale this is in comparison to Christian theology in a moment. Number two, God wants people to be nice to one another and fair. This is the teaching of every major religion. Okay. Number three, the central goal and purpose in life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. I like to call this the gospel of Stuart Smalley. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Number four, God does not need to be involved in our lives except when there are problems to be resolved. This is God the heavenly grandfather, not the heavenly father. He steps in when you have cancer to heal you, but otherwise do as you please as long as you play nice with one another. And number five, good people will go to heaven. Now, we might want to stop and think about this. Where have we seen moralistic, therapeutic deism? This term comes from, I'll parse it out for you. We'll start with the end. Deism refers to a view of God that believes that there is a God who exists. He brought the world into existence, but other than that, he has no other interactions with it. There is no providence. There is no miracles. There is no incarnation. There is no other manifestations of God. God is just in the sky looking down, smiling. As one Anglican bishop describing this once put it, this is spy in the sky theology. God is just looking down on us, either happily or slightly angry, but otherwise having no real interactions with us. That's deism. Why therapeutic? Because the ultimate purpose of God in this vision is that God will simply step in to resolve major difficulties, cancer, divorces, problems we have in our life, anxiety. He's there to make us feel good, to give us a spirituality of comfort, never to call us to anything beyond what we are, never to challenge us to struggle against ourselves. And moralistic, because it offers at least a baseline morality. Be good, fair, and nice to one another. But hopefully we can see how this is pale in comparison to our own Christian theology. But Step back and think, where have we heard this? Where do we see this in the television, in the movies, in the pop culture, in the people around us? 
Then you begin to notice just how prevalent this is, even among some that would espouse themselves to be Christians. And if this were truly the nature of God, if this were truly the nature of religion, what possible role would asceticism play in this? This understanding, this gospel of moralistic therapeutic deism, can't call you to become anything more than nice, good, kind. Why would you ever have to fast to do that? Why would you ever have to make a prostration to do that? Why would you ever have to keep a rule of prayer to do that? Certainly we could see that we are at odds here. And if the main purpose of life is simply to be happy and feel good about oneself, and not, as we would understand it, to be called to become in the image and likeness of God, well, how are you going to become happy by restraining your stomach? If you want to be happy, you should eat everything that you would like to. You could see the implications as they spell out here. This is a form of godliness that is bereft of the power thereof. This is an impotent gospel, and it can offer no salvation. On the contrary, for us as Christians, though, we would say that God did indeed create us, and he does oversee the world, but he is not distinct from it and separate from it, but interacts with us regularly. We feel his presence in prayer. We know him to have been manifest in Christ and in the Holy Spirit in the church. He's certainly not off like a spy in the sky or a happy grandfather. And what has he called us to be? Not simply happy, not simply fair and good, but one another, but he has called us to become in his image and in his likeness. He's called us out of nothing and has given us the opportunity to participate in his life and nature. He doesn't simply call us to be nice, but has called us to be holy as he is holy. And our central goal in life is not to be happy and to have high self-esteem, but to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, as we heard St. Paul uh, call on Timothy to do today. This may not make us happy at times, at least in the short term, but we know that ultimately we are looking to eternal blessings in Christ. And so what does St. Paul tell us today? Let us hear what he had to say to St. Timothy. Now you, my son Timothy, you have carefully followed my doctrine my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions and afflictions which happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of, knowing from, what, from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures and were able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We see then that St. Paul charges Timothy and us to follow his doctrine, not the doctrine of moralistic therapeutic deism and other false gospels, to follow his life and example, not the lives and examples of those that we see in the pop culture around us. For St. Paul lived no life of hypocrisy. St. John Chrysostom says he did not simply say these things, how we ought to live, how we ought to follow Christ, but he gives us the example because he lived them himself. He was a philosopher in action, not in word only. And he believed what he did so much that he was willing to suffer the persecution and difficulties that he faced. And you notice, if the purpose in life was to be happy and to feel good about oneself, poor St. Paul missed that boat. St. Paul missed that part of the gospel, apparently. No, instead, St. John Chrysostom again reminds us that as we are called to wrestle and struggle for our salvation, just as someone who enters into the wrestling ring cannot be partaking of a, of a five-course uh, meal at the same time as they're engaged in their struggle, so too we in our spiritual lives must choose between wrestling, struggling for our salvation, or feasting in our passions. And we need to progress in the spiritual life. 
We heard St. Paul warn us about those evil and deceivers who go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And we see that in all of our life, we are progressing in one direction or the other. And this time of the fast that lies before us is given for us to advance ourselves in spirituality, advance ourselves in godliness. St. Augustine, speaking on this, tells us, make progress in doing good, progress in good faith, that is, struggle to obtain true doctrine, progress in good deeds, that is, struggle to perform God sa godly and saving actions. Keep advancing. Do not wander off the course. Do not return to your old life of sin. Do not stand still. Well, just as we see, saw that this moralistic, therapeutic deism lay at the root of this life of sinfulness that St. Paul was uh, trying to root out, what is the root here of a life of piety? And St. Paul ended this passage by calling on Timothy to focus on one thing. He reminded him to continue in the learning he had received, and specifically the knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, saying, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, here we see then what we need to root ourselves in if we wish to thwart the passions that take us away from God. And it is to have our minds formed by the Holy Scriptures. St. Timothy, it was said, from his childhood had grown up with the knowledge of the Scriptures. And so, too, we must struggle to impart such a knowledge to our children. And if we didn't receive it as children, to become like children, to sit at the feet of Christ and to hear his holy words that we find in the Gospel. If we do this, we will become like the tree planted by the waters that we hear of in the first psalm, in the book of the Psalms. The tree that, sitting by the waters, its leaf never, 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 never withers, and it is always fruitful. And the fathers point out that the leaves on that tree are the holy virtues that are, are uh, shown forth in a life rooted in Christ. And the fruit is true doctrine and knowledge of God. We spend so much time, do we not, in the world seeking after so many forms of knowledge. And yet, if we're true to ourselves, we know that we are like those persons that St. Paul said, that they are always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Instead, we need to root ourselves and seek the ultimate knowledge that leads to salvation. This knowledge we find in Scripture. For St. Jerome tells us, he charged one of his younger uh, colleagues, a new priest, live among these books, meditate on them, know nothing else and seek nothing else, for in them you will find a foretaste of life in heaven. So brothers and sisters, now, as the gates of the arena of repentance are opening unto you, I call upon you, cast aside the false images of God that have no power to help you into salvation. Put aside the fear of the struggle and embrace it so that you might work for your salvation. Seek the virtue of the Pharisee, but put aside judgmentalism and self-righteousness. Seek the humility of the tax collector, but put aside his sinfulness. And let us root ourselves in Scripture so that we might live godly lives in Christ Jesus. Amen.